we're going to have a short presentation from Anna Greenberg, and then the conversation is going to kind of go back and forth. I want to bring you into the conversation too. So, what's the microphone situation for the audience? Still finding out. Okay. Well, I'm hoping there'll be a microphone, and I definitely want to bring bring you into it. Um, and so we've got about an hour and 15 minutes, and my aim is for at least the last 45 minutes of it to be very interactive with the audience. So let's get started. Let's see how it goes. Ethan, um, you are up first. Okay. <clears throat> Graham, thank you. Thank you very much. So just going to say for a few minutes, um, you know, in terms of the marijuana reform thing, we, we have something going on, obviously, in the last five or six years that we don't fully understand which is this remarkable transformation in public opinion around marijuana. You know, the Gallup polls going from 36% in favor of legalizing marijuana use in 2005 to 50% today, opposition dropping from 60% to 46%, so 14-point swings on either side. I mean, it, it's remarkable. And we can have lots of speculation about why this has happened and what role medical marijuana played and what role the entertainment media played and what role we all as advocates played, but it's really hard to say. We can assume for demographic reasons, because young people are more supportive and uh, old people you know, who are more opposed are dying off, essentially, uh, that, 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 that the demographic trends are in our favor. We know we lose people as they get older, um, you know, because you know, one essential definition of parenthood is hypocrisy. But nonetheless, um, you know, we do, it does seem like we're moving in the right direction. On the other hand, we have the lesson of the late 1970s when we thought, you know, hell, State, 11 states had decriminalized, uh, and then things, you know, we had 30% in favor of legalizing marijuana, according to the Gallup poll, and it dropped down to the low 20s by the mid-80s. In, in, in the late 70s, over 50% of college freshmen, I think it was, favored marijuana legalization. By, uh, by, by the mid-1980s, it was down to 16%. So the possibility for significant cultural transformation in the wrong direction exists. And that means we have to be smart and savvy about how we proceed in this thing. The other thing is with medical marijuana, I mean, obviously, you know, we picked off the low-hanging fruit in the 90s in the Western states and some others, and then DPA and MPP and local activists did a lot of work to, to, to actually change the laws in a number of other states. Now it's getting tougher. It's getting tougher. You know, and part of the question is winning these things. It was hard to tell whether there's any slight shift in medical marijuana opinion going on right now because of, uh, you know, whether it's reaction against negative media in L.A. or things like that. Uh, we saw the losses in South Dakota, the second one, and Oregon again and such like that. Arizona just squeaked by. Um, so it's hard to know. But what I said, I said this in my speech just before, you know, our universe is getting increasingly complex, Right. There's legalization and trying to snatch those victories. We have initiatives moving forward in part because of smart local activists in places like Washington and Colorado who are moving forward to try to do legalization initiatives when there's only 52% in favor and over 40% against, which is not typically a recipe for success. Typically, that's a recipe for not winning. So we have to do something different than we've ever done in order to win with numbers that low. Right? And we have to now, I think the consequences of losing are not devastating as long as we acquit ourselves well. And the case of Prop 19 was a case of winning, at least nationally, even though we lost locally. Whether we actually won in California with losing Prop 19 is more of an open question. But in terms of nationally, I think we did. That's on the legalization front. We've got to be smart. We've got to, you know, the rush to do initiatives all the time, I'm always a little wary and reluctant. My general view for anybody who wants to do it is if you do it, draft it smart, get our help and buy in early on if you can. And to the extent the numbers start to look really winnable, that's when I'll make a commitment to try to raise serious money to help this thing win. For the ones that don't have a chance of winning and they're just doing it to run, well, at least draft them smart. Make it credible, make it respectable. I can't promise much in the way of resources or money, but at least let's do it right. Medical marijuana, you know, the world's getting more and more complex, as I said before. Managing what happens when irresponsible entrepreneurs, like in Montana or whatever, start to do shit, you know, we just gotta manage that stuff and keep it moving. And finally, marijuana arrests. There's a victory that DPA played a leadership role on with our allies, Vocal and others, in New York City. We beat Ray Kelly, the NYPD commissioner. Nobody beats Ray Kelly. And we got him to back down 50,000 marijuana arrests, you know, cutting that. The fact of the matter is, if we could reduce the 750,000 or 800,000 marijuana arrests in America down to 90%, that would be a massive victory. 
if you think, why are we involved in this battle? For some of us, it's the principle of legalization. But I think for most of us, it's that the harms that happen by marijuana prohibition. That's what we're trying to reduce. So legalizing marijuana, do it smart. Medical marijuana getting complicated, we gotta be more and more sophisticated. But reducing marijuana arrests and playing on the, going at the racial injustice angle, that's a pivotal part of this as well. And there's a strong argument to be made that reducing marijuana arrests actually reduces the support for sustaining marijuana prohibition among the prison industrial complex. When they no longer see it in their interest to arrest people, they have less interest in keeping those laws on the books. I'll stop there. So just listening to Ethan, a couple of things occurred to me. One is we're going to really focus in on legalizing marijuana. There are a lot of marijuana-related topics. What we're really going to do is focus in on what is it going to take to legalize marijuana at a state level in a given state. The other thing that it, it strikes me is this has the potential to be a super geeky panel. Lots of numbers and statistics are going to be thrown at you. And I guess I want to start with just what is to me the most profound statistic, which is that half of Americans support legalization. So what the hell? <laughs> why, don't, why isn't it legal? How many other issues are there where the majority of people think that it's okay to do it? and yet we actually put people in prison for doing it. There's nothing else like that. There's nothing else like that. And so it seems like at one level, at a sort of intuitive level, this should be relatively easy. And yet we know from bitter experience that it is the opposite of that. It is very, very hard. So you're gonna hear next from Anna Greenberg. Anna is one of the, um, I think, best known and best pollsters um, working, and I don't say that uh, to, the, uh, to, to cast aspersions on the other best known and, and, and best uh, pollster sitting at the other end of the table who we're also going to hear from. Um, the two best pollsters in America, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, here they are. Anna has done a, a piece of work that has tried to just kind of dig in deep to what does it take to win legalization. To, she's looked back at every single election and every single poll, every piece of research that has ever been done about marijuana and tried to draw broad lessons from that. And then she has looked more recently exactly at where we are now. And so she comes to us as a sort of an oracle um, to tell us where we are, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. Now, she has the challenge of having to do this in about five minutes. So um, it's going to be a very, very superficial um, presentation of some very deep research. But I think as we have a conversation about it, we can, we, we can kind of get into some different parts of it. So Anna, all yours. Thanks, Graham. There's a, that's a, it's a lot to live up to. And um, I talk really fast, so which my dad always says is a sign of being really smart. So hopefully I'll be able to get through a lot uh, in the five minutes that I have. As Graham said, I've been working on this for a little over a year with Graham and others and some people who are in this room from the research side, not from the activist side, not from the legislative side, but really trying to take a very honest look at support for legalization, uh, opposition to legalization, and how can you actually move numbers on the ground towards a place where we can exploit what is a trend going in favor of legalization. And as Graham said, it's really, really hard. And hopefully during Q&A, I can answer some questions about messaging and about why people have issues with legalization. But right now, I'm just going to talk about, um, you know, literally how do you try to move the needle on legalization. Let me start with let me start with um, a slide that has been mentioned both by Ethan and by Graham, which is generally the trend on public opinion around legalization. We have data from the Gallup organization going back, in this case, to the mid-90s. And what you can see is really dramatic changes in public opinion about legalization. There are not many issues that show this rapid change. I, the only other issue that really is equivalent, in my view, is same-sex marriage, which you know we've been tracking for about, for about the same time period at least in kind of national polls, and you see the same kind of rapid growth. But most other issues, public opinion changes very slowly over time. And so we're in a, a, a place here where in 95, 73% of people oppose legalization. Now that's down to 46, and we're just at 50% of people saying they favor legalization. Now, we could talk a lot about why this has happened, and I have some ideas about it, but one of the things I just want to note 
that I actually think is pretty encouraging, and it contradicts a little bit about what Ethan said about generational differences. There isn't any doubt that part of what's pushed the change is that younger people are more favorable towards legalization than older people. But what this uh, analysis shows, which I'm sure none of you actually understand, this is time series data from the General Social Survey going back to the early 70s on legalization by cohort. So looking at different generations. And what you can see is over the course of the 80s during the kind of war on drugs period, you know, a pretty significant decline in support for legalization across the board. And since the early 90s, slow and steady uh, increase in support for legalization, which again culminates in the previous slide at 50% currently supporting. The thing to note, if you look, for example, at the red dotted line at the bottom, that are those are people who were born before 1935. You can see that even though they're the lowest on support, there actually is increase in support for legalization in that generation. And if you look at people born between 36 and 45, you actually see, again, you know, you still have only 30% currently supporting legalization, but you can see that that's up from about 10%. So while it is true that younger people are driving some of the attitudinal change, it's also the case that there has been broader societal change because older people are moving as well. And there are lots of reasons for it, including some of the ones that Ethan um, has mentioned. So I'm gonna skip to now. Um, and talk about sort of the most current efforts to try to legalize marijuana. And of course, the most recent and prominent example was the Prop 19 campaign here in California. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with uh, the, the chart that I'm showing you now. This is just a time series slide showing public opinion around Prop 19 over the course, really from spring of 2010 till election day in November. And there are a number of things that are very striking about this slide. One, if you look at people who supported, if you look at the, the line which is green, which is the percent that favors Prop 19, there's some variation. These polls are both private polls and public polls, so some of the variation is really just a reflection of different polling organizations. It's not really movement over time. So if you were to sort of average over the course of Prop 19 up until the last three weeks of the election, you had about 50 percent, sometimes just under, sometimes just over favoring Prop 19. Now, that's very similar to the national number, right? It's very, very similar. And what you have is you know, somewhere in the 40% opposing. Again, very similar to the national number. California was at the same starting point as the overall population. And what you see at the end is a pretty radical drop uh, in support for Prop 19 and pretty radical increase in opposition. And one of the things that we've done over the course of the last year, as Graham said, was looked at every, uh, you know, every uh, reform initiative, whether it was legalization or medical or decrim or distribution centers, and we found a very similar trend, which is in the last few weeks leading up to the election, there was a five to six point drop in support for the reform position, whatever that reform might have been. Um, and so we actually spent some time trying to look at that in California and did you know, panel study, looking at people who had been interviewed before um, the election and then talked to people after the election and asked them you know, how they voted. And what we found was that there was real drop off in our base of support. In other words, we have people who are probably yeses or weak supporters who in the absence of a kind of sustained communication campaign and the right kind of information, you know, it's a pretty radical societal change, get, you know, sort of get nervous and, and vote the other way. And again, I think that even though we were able to look at that specifically in California through the use of panel, I suspect the same dynamic is going on in other places. It's also reflected in where the intensity is. So this is just looking at a survey um, on Prop 19 in um, 09, and then looking at um, a survey towards the end of the campaign in October of 2010. And what you can see is that there is more intensity on the opposition side than there is on our side. And this is also true of a lot of social issues where you're asking people to kind of make a very significant kind of change in our society. Again, there's a lot of parallels to same-sex marriage. You see, the very, you see a very similar dynamic where people um, are, there, there's more strong opposition to same-sex marriage than there is strong support for same-sex marriage. And so you can, but you can also see the dynamics of the campaign, and this, re, this is reflected in the drop in support towards the end, towards the election, is reflected in the intensity gap here. So you can see, you know, two years out or a year and a half out, um, you know, you had fairly equal levels of intensity and support for Prop 19 or legalization, and you can see by election day, you had 41% saying they were definitely going to vote no, um, and uh, on the uh, yes side, you had 27% saying they're definitely going to vote yes. So what we see is, you know, drop off in our base and increased intensity on, on the other side towards the end of these legalization campaigns. So where does that leave us? 
Well, we are now at the beginning of a new election cycle in 20, for 2012, and we have a few states, in particular Colorado and Washington, both of which have legalization measures uh, that are going to be on the ballots. And I should say, in, in keeping with what Ethan said about the construction of the ballot language, in both those cases, really important research was done in how those ballots were constructed. And the language in those ballots um, reflect you know, and research across, the, across, you know, not just California and Colorado and Washington, also in Arizona and South Dakota and Massachusetts and Ohio and other places. And it was both focus groups and survey research. But what's interesting to note is that if you look in Colorado and Washington, we're starting out in a very similar place that Prop 19 started and a very similar place to what the national data look like. And I want to be clear that particularly with the Colorado March numbers, that number reflects the ballot language that is actually going to be, or at least close to, what's going to be on the ballot in Colorado. So it's not just a generic, you know, do you favor or oppose legalization. It actually reflects the actual content of the ballot. So one of the things, and Ethan said this, one of the things that you have to think when you look at Colorado and Washington right now is in the absence of, you know, serious, you know, obviously a seriously funded campaign uh, and other things, these are more likely to lose than to win, even though you've got kind of bare majority support, because we know the dynamics of these races are that the base, there's more intensity on the other side, and that our, our weak supporters uh, drop off as we get closer to election day. So one of the things that, um, that we did recently, um, and people in Colorado are probably very familiar with it, we did an experiment in Colorado, and what we said was, if we provide public education about marijuana and legalization, not necessarily about the ballot, not necessarily about the political question of whether or not we should legalize, but in general have a conversation about the benefits of legalization, can we change people's attitudes about legalization and about marijuana and about the role that marijuana plays in our society? And could that be a precursor to building support when you get to the actual initiative campaign? So in other words, can you change attitudes and also increase the intensity of your base's support so that when you get to the point of doing the actual campaign, you're positioned in a better place? And so through a lot of research and a lot of testing, um, we, along with you know people on the ground in Colorado and a media firm, developed a campaign that included two ads. Um, and you may or may not have seen them, but they were mainly about having a conversation about legalizing marijuana, as well as supported it with direct mail pieces, four mail pieces to a targeted universe, as well as an online advertising campaign and a social media campaign. And it was done in the Colorado Springs media market. We had a control market, which was the Denver metro market. So, and I'm trying to do this very fast, I know. <laughs> the, what we found was that after the first ad, which was a very conversational ad, a woman in a coffee shop talking about the benefits of legalization, heavily focused on the revenue that legalization could produce and directing that revenue to education, healthcare, and law enforcement, what we saw in the target market, which is your um, left-hand side, uh, if you look at the midpoint after that ad, we actually saw a, a, a statistically significant jump in support for legalization. This is not the ballot. This is just legalization. You can see we went from people being evenly divided in Colorado Springs to an eight-point margin after that first ad and, and also the two uh, mail pieces. And when we did the open-ended um, recall questions about what they'd seen, they very clearly understood what the ads were about. They very clearly parroted back the arguments in the ad. By the way, one of the things that was interesting is not only did we see movement among the people that we targeted, we very specifically targeted women aged 50 to 30 to 50, um, but also overall we saw movement among conservatives and Republicans towards favoring um, legalization, which was a nice byproduct. It was not our intended goal, but it actually produced that. And you can see there was no movement in the control market, so it's our belief that that movement was real. However, when we ran the second ad, which was a much harder hitting ad, um, with a cop as the spokesperson talking about kind of the irrationality of, um, of our sort of uh, our, our marijuana laws and that the gangs control it and not us and that the need to kind of take control of the system and that we need to control it. And some mention of revenue, but very much focused on law enforcement resources, which is another very important argument about reforming marijuana. You can see that actually we saw movement in the other direction. Actually, things went back to where they were, and it actually was quite polarizing. In other words, we saw um, we didn't lose any of the uh, gains that we'd made on our side among Democrats, among liberals, among our targets. In fact, we even gained a little support, but we saw backward movement among conservatives and Republicans and others. And what this whole experiment showed us that it, it is possible to create some attitudinal change, and that was actually pretty exciting because I can tell you it's not easy to do that. And you know, with three thousand points of four pieces of mail, which is not a you know, over the course of four weeks, um, it's pretty impressive. On the other hand, what it told us is that you can also polarize this issue pretty easily, right? This, this is not, is, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of nuance that's required to message about legalization. There's a lot of opportunity to move people, but there's also a lot of uh, pitfalls. 
The other thing that we saw was there wasn't any movement on the ballot. Now, to be clear, we never mentioned the ballot in either ads. The whole idea of a public education campaign is to try to change attitudes, build intensity prior to a campaign around the ballot. Regardless, it would have been nice <laughs> to see some movement on the ballot question, but there wasn't any movement on the ballot question after the public education campaign. So where I want to sort of stop and then I'm pass it on to, uh, to others on the panel is to say that one of the things that is so exciting about this research is you can take a look at the national environment where you have a majority of people favoring legalization. You look in California, Colorado, and Washington where you have you know, a little over 50, depending on the poll, favoring legalization. And you have a campaign, you know, not you know, a very well-researched and well-funded campaign, but it was only a month. And it was two ads and four pieces of mail. And with that campaign, we were able to not just move you know, attitudes about legalization I didn't show you all the data because I don't have time, but we were able to move Democrats in a very big way towards supporting the ballot. We were able to move liberals. We were able to move the target, which was women uh, 30 to 50. Um, I can tell you why later if you want to know why that's a target group. And yet, on the, other on, on the other hand, it just reinforced how hard it is to pass legalization because the countervailing forces are very strong. They're in, they, are, they are internalized because people's personal experiences have such a profound impact about how they feel about marijuana. And people's inclination is to be cautious uh, and not embrace kind of bold change. So I'll stop there and pass it along. Thanks, Anna. So, so what I want to try to do here is um, ask the rest of our panelists to engage with this, um, to tell us what they think this means, to ask Anna some questions. Um, and as you uh, volunteer yourselves to speak, I will also introduce you, or if you like, you can introduce yourself, but I don't want to kind of take our time of marching down and doing introductions through the panel. So who wants to go first? Who, who has a reaction to sort of uh, to, to what we've just heard from Anna? Okay, Alan St. Pierre, many of you know him, the head of Normal. Um, well, thank you, Anna, for pulling all this information together <clears throat> because it's really giving us the clear roadmap that we need um, to help frame the messages and strategy. For me, it's how do we get to 60%. Um, those of us who have been involved with initiatives in and out of drug policy reform know you really need the magic number of about 58.5% for six months consistently before you really should launch prudently, as Ethan has already alluded to. So how do we get to 60%? Well, we know that even in California here, where the issue of marijuana has been vetted more than anywhere on the face of the earth, 50%, just slightly 50, less than 50% of Californians fear marijuana more than they do alcohol. Now that is illogical. It pharmacologically makes no sense. But we, I don't think, will probably get to the point of 60 percentile unless we can drive those numbers down by 40 to 50 percent. People are, it doesn't make any sense that if half the society in California, let alone in the <laughs> Kansases and Georgias and South Carolinas of the world, in California, 50 percent of the citizens fear marijuana. So we so, have to. So, so Alan, let me interrupt you for a second. So we've got to we've, we've got to address fears about marijuana. I hear that, but let me let me pick at one of your premises here and uh, and ask for a quick poll here. Who does anybody disagree that you need to get to sixty percent or very close to sixty percent for a legalization ballot measure to be viable? Is that do we have consensus on that? Dave Dave Fratello from Coast Campaign is going to take issue with that. Well, maybe I, I, I'm not going to take issue with the conventional wisdom among political consultants that you need 60% to win to, uh, to have, I mean, all of these are gradations of uh, likelihood of success. Um, if you're at 51, 52, 53, there's a slim likelihood of success. It's better than being at 43 or, or something like that. So, you know, it's just that the campaign is so much how, harder how because slim? everything has to break your way. Well, with the numbers that you, that Anna was just showing us, is, the, is it a one in a hundred, one in a million? Yeah, I mean, it's 10%. It's, it's Okay, so one in ten chances is what you it. say. Mark Steets, another campaign strategist, uh, well, DC based. What, what, what do you think on that? I mean, I, I think that let's not get overcome by specific benchmarks, though the, I absolutely agree with it. I do think one important thing out of the Colorado experiment, and one of the really encouraging things to see in a variety of these efforts, is that some campaigns are run on a let's come up with our message, stick to it, and and, and play the cam 
play the campaign out. So you think up what your idea is, you get the language, and you go for it. The way to victory, there is, there are numbers and things that could change the numbers you have to start with. There are numbers to be picked up if we test and adjust because there are lots of surprises. Lots of times things that you think are the strongest arguments and that test well with one group of people have the worst backlash effects. We're finding, we're learning again and again that backlash effects are big and they're not sort of, they're not exactly what we expect. There are some arguments that don't have backlash. Uh, there's the issue of sequencing of arguments. If you start, if you're having an argument about kids and pot use, and then you shift to the argument about cost and the savings to the judiciary, to, to, from prisons, you're gonna get creamed. You're gonna, you're gonna make things worse than, you, w worse than when you started. If you start with a question about this system obviously isn't working, there are a variety of ways it's failing, and then you shift the cost, you win. So all the, the, types of, uh, the types of things you can do during the course of a campaign to adjust your message in response to what's happening and be more effective and agile doing that will change the number you have to start with over time. Okay, so Solendo Lake. Um, uh, the 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 uh, I like that we're bookending the pollsters here. You know the the, the, the oracles of either end. So, so Linda, what's your take on this? Uh, I, I think there are a couple of things. I think that uh, just to build on Anna's presentation, I would say there's some broad-based currents out there that offer us opportunity. There are also some broad-based currents out there that offer us challenges. We think of 2012 as being a very good year for us uh, because of the nature of the electorate. Uh, because of the budget situation in a lot of states. I would also argue there's some ways in which it's a very bad year for us. Um, so first of all, I think um, there's the obvious opportunity around tax, regulate, and priorities. And we think about the first part of that tax. I don't think we paid enough attention to the part of regulate and priorities. Priorities about where we're gonna spend our resources. Priorities about um, how we're gonna treat our kids and regulation in terms of reducing the risk factor. One of the biggest problems we have out there is that we have women voters, this 30 to 50 year old cohort, who is very risk aversive and even more risk aversive when it comes to kids. And I don't think we've looked enough at a women's strategy. We also haven't looked enough at how regulate could actually reduce risk rather than increase risk. The second thing that's going on out there is concern about public safety is actually on the rise. People have an internal hypothesis that crime goes up in a bad economy. Uh, so, uh, inter and women in particular believe that crime goes up in a bad economy. So actually, women are getting more concerned about public safety, and you don't see it in the polls because the economy and jobs drowns everything else out. Uh, we don't want people concerned about public safety, uh, obviously, and as Anna related in the Colorado experience, it's, you know, we're not gonna be able here to scare people straight with just putting a cop in our ad and hoping uh, that that's gonna deal with this risk factor, this concern about public safety, but in that way, I think it's making things worse. Third, I don't think we thought enough about unusual allies, and I talked to Ethan about this a while ago. I think it'd be very interesting, for example, with all these veterans coming back from Iraq, with people on their fourth, fifth, and sixth tour on Afghanistan, uh, what about talking to Vote Vets, the organization of Afghanistan and Iraq vets? What about these guys saying, listen, do you know what we're doing uh, in terms of resources and danger that we are exposed to uh, because we're operating this, bro we're continuing to operate this broken system in the way that we're operating it? Does that completely change and flip the frame? The last thing I'll say is I think particularly for women, and Anna and I have done a lot of work on this in the marriage equality arena, we have to allow women some of their ambivalence. We want everybody to be completely comfortable and agree with us. And the most effective uh, things uh, may allow people some ambivalence uh, and, and some concern to legitimize that, but to say whether it's priorities, whether it's risk, whether it's our kids, whether it's regulation, that to resolve this ambivalence in this way is the better way to go than the way we're going right now. So in short, uh, and by the way, women are extremely risk averse right now because they think the whole, their whole life is so unstable uh, right now. So I think there are some opportunities in priorities and regulation and taxes. There's some challenges in public safety and risk taking, particularly vis-a-vis -vis women. 
So, so I, I, I'm hearing a lot about messaging. I mean, so Linda, that's you know who we're talking to and what we say to them. That was Alan's point in some ways. Um, Mark talking about the sequencing of the message. The, and I guess these are all ways of talking about if we accept the premise that you need to get up to the 60% so that on election day when it drops down, we still have a majority. Um, one of the things we played with, though, and, and, and I want to ask Anna to talk about this, is, well, maybe there's another path to victory, which is that you don't have to have 60% so that you've got the 10-point buffer. But what if instead, out of your 54% who, who, who say they support your measure, more of them are committed yeses? So that you're bolstering your, your base. Instead of starting with the sort of 32% who are definite yes, what if you get that up to 40, 45? And does the public education, that is the pre-political campaign effort to shape the ground, look different if what you're aiming for is increasing the number of definite yes voters as opposed to adding more soft yes voters? So I, 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 I feel I, my fear in all of this is that some of it is like so mired in this technical detail that I'm concerned that you guys are like, what the hell is he talking about? So I, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Anna to, to deal with this, and then we are gonna bring you into the conversation. Okay, thanks, Graham. So what Graham is talking about is, can you address the drop-off issue that I talked about at the very beginning when you saw that California Prop 19 slide, which was the drop-off at the end, and then the consistent finding across different states that we tend to lose five to six points? Well, why does that happen? Well, part of what happens is undecideds break the wrong way, but part of what happens is your your weak supporters or your probably yeses end up voting no, and that's exactly what we saw in California. So the, the question is, can you provide enough information to people that you prevent that drop off? And what we found in the Colorado experiment was, yes, you can actually bolster intensity. So what you're seeing in this slide is the ballot question, and we're just showing the definitely yeses and the definitely noes. And what you can see over the course of the experiment, where we ran, like I said, two ads and four pieces of mail, that on the definitely yes side, we had a five point increase in intensity, keeping in mind this is Colorado Springs, so it looks a little more conservative than Colorado overall. Colorado overall, the starting point's about 31%. You can see a five point increase. Of course, what you can see on the other side is we increase intensity as well. We went from 30 to 35 on the definitely knows. We can talk about whether or not that's a, you know, a problem. I think it's probably less of a problem than the need because most of those folks were gonna vote no anyway. Uh, we're not as worried about, we don't see the same kind of drop off on the no side, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So increasing the intensity on the no side in some ways is less of a concern than whether or not you have the ability to increase the yeses on, on your side. I also think we learned a lot from this experiment about how we might reduce the chances that we increase intensity on their side. But what I want to show you, which is one of, I think, the most encouraging things we found in Colorado, was the movement with our base of support, who should be Democrats and liberals, and the target group, which is that group of women 30 to 50. And what you can see here is that there were very significant increases in intensity. Look at that d the Democratic category in the middle. Went from 39 s definite yes to 53 definite yes over the course of one month. On liberals, we went from 49 to 57. And with our target women, we went from 28 to 39. So there's a little overlap, but not complete overlap among these groups. There really is, I think, some important evidence that when we're running these campaigns, if we do our targeting and messaging right, we can actually increase the intensity of our base of support and reduce the chances of drop off and potentially, to go to Dave Fertella's point, potentially win even if you're not at 60 or 58% as a starting point. Can I add something to that, Graham? Um, sure, before you do that, let me just kind of do one clarifying thing too. Um, sure. Look at the middle part of this slide where it says Democrats. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna decode this a little bit. Remember, we're talking about for two weeks doing one approach, which is kind of a soft approach. It is a woman who has, it, it's a commercial saying, it's not that I like marijuana, but it's time that we have a conversation about this. And, um, and, then, the, and then we stopped, and then for two weeks we had the, the cop you know, looking right in the camera saying, you know, it's time we took control of this. So much harder, much more direct, polarizing. And you saw that the overall numbers ended up being a wash um, because the woman, I think, sort of invited the people who were just on the fence a little bit towards no to kind of come over to our side. Conversation, that seems nice, right? But the harder approach basically said, you need to decide. And so people are like, okay, fine, I, I, I know where I stand. I'm back on the no side. But go back to the, to the intensity side. But look at the Democrats. The soft approach, 
converted some people who were kind of yes on the fence to saying definitely yes. And then the hard approach with the cop converted some more people from I'm kind of, you know, a soft supporter to yeah, I'm with you. So what does it all mean? I don't know, but it's really, really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay, Celinda. Uh, two things I would say uh, about this, because <clears throat> I think this is a very intriguing approach about, um, and I think this experiment was fabulous, don't misunderstand me. Um, but the real way to, I think, the, the next experiment that ought to be done is not a shock and awe campaign, because people realize they were being campaigned to. The way that you really do public education that long-term changes attitudes is when people aren't aware, oh, I saw that ad, I got that direct mail piece that changed my mind or gave me this information, because then when they get the next direct mail piece or see that ad, and we saw that in Prop 8 here in California, then they just move back. Because <laughs> one of the things here is you didn't have any counter public education. It's when people think, wait a minute, I heard this from my friend. And like for women, for example, a third of women now say they get their information from friends and family. So what would be very interesting is to take some of these education techniques and try to identify the influentials. The 1% of, the 10% of people who tell the rest of the 90% of us what to eat, how to believe, and what to buy. And have them influence their channels of friends and family so that people don't think, oh, I saw that ad, now I see this ad. But people think, wait a minute, I've been hearing wait a minute, my friend told me, I'm not sure that's right. I was talking to the teacher and so I think the next stage of this experimentation increasing intensity is actually a much lower key public education mm -hmm. campaign over time using social media, using friends and family uh, that creates I think more durable uh, intensity because people don't think I saw that ad therefore I might buy the other ad but people think wait a minute, I've been thinking about this, I've been hearing about this and I feel different. And there are a number of experiments in the marriage equality arena here in California going on around that that I think have very interesting models for this debate as well. I, I think that's an excellent point. So I, I, I'm, I'm, gonna do, I'm gonna do this, folks. Um, we've got about 40 minutes, give or take, of time. And I really do want to broaden the conversation. We as a people need to have a consensus that yes, a state has the right to input Marijuana, so your pollsters, I would like to see questions phrased at every state of the union saying something like, seeing as how we, the people of state of, insert, have the constitutional right to tax, license, regulate, and prohibit such things as gambling, prostitution, firearms, tobacco, gay marriages, tanning beds, do you think that we, the people of the state of, have the right to say anything about the control of marijuana? That's a question I would like to ask everybody in America. And if you say, no, we don't have that right, the battle's over. Because the day one of these referendums pass, folks, that's the day the war's going to start. <laughs> what would have happened? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I, I, I think that's an excellent question. And, um, and in fact, there has been a little bit of research on this. So let's, let, let's, let's hear about that. Um, Dave, you seem to have jumped first, so go ahead. <laughs> I'm a runner, I fast all the time. Uh, well, I, one of the things I want to point to is, as I said before, alternative models. Um, you know, you, you have to be able to win the post game. Um, and if a lot of us think we're trying to sort of repeat the experience of alcohol prohibition, um, to my knowledge, no state opted out of alcohol prohibition by saying, Screw you, feds. We're just going to tax and regulate it here under state law. Be Thank you. Yeah. Got a history lesson. Uh, but the overwhelming number of states uh, instead said, we are repealing our state laws that enforce your laws. Uh, we're opting out. Uh, and that is an equally valid approach. Uh, and I will take a moment. I was not invited here to promote this campaign, but we are sponsoring two initiatives, uh, and the one that's ready for petitioning right now is in Oregon, in the state of Oregon. There's a handout that may be going around. Uh, the entire initiative actually fits at the bottom of the page, uh, so it's not 30 or 40 or 60 pages long, it's four sentences. Uh, this measure says simply uh, there will be no criminal penalties for the possession or production of marijuana by individuals who are over 21. Uh, and the state can go ahead and set limits and regulations uh, and go further if they want to. But this is a different way of approaching the question. 
And I frankly think it has a better chance of surviving. It has, I think it first has a better chance to win in, uh, straight up, uh, but it also has a better chance to survive and to give the feds ultimately a way out. Uh, the feds are not going to move immediately because they're so uh, dazzled by our uh, performance getting 51% of the vote someplace to uh, pull up a congressional bill and start repealing. Uh, but they are somewhat more likely to find a way to just get out of the way. Uh, so I, I, this is, I, I think, an alternative kind of approach. There's a similar one we've got for Montana uh, that I think should also be part of the discussion. So, M Mar Mark, you're unusually quiet. Um, <laughs> And I've, I, I've talked to you some about these federal issues, but I also want to invite you to, to say something else if you, if you want to, but if you well, want to no, respond I, to this I question. Guess, I guess the, on the federal issues, the issue of the differences between the states and just how radically different this country is in different places should never be forgotten. Sure. There's a great book called Rich State, Poor State, Red State, Blue State by a, a statistician named Andrew Gelman where he sort of talks about the cultural differences between different states. I do think that we'll make progress some places long before we make any movement other places. That's op almost obvious. And I do think the federal government and lots of people, there, there are lots of places where we will be, where people will be receptive to the argument that let states make their own decisions. And their gay marriage really is the model. Yes. You know what I mean? And I, th I think that, would, mm -hmm. okay. That's all I have to say on that. So um, five minutes. What we're going to do now is I'm going to ask the four people who are standing up here to each ask a question that they state very briefly. And just let's listen to all four of the questions, and then we'll let people respond if they want to to one of those questions to make closing comments, and then we will move it on to the next thing. So come on up. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Melissa Sanchez, and I'm from San Francisco. Um, Briefly stated, my question is, uh, can you, the panelists address the Latino vote mm -hmm. here in California? Um, I work with the Normal Women's Alliance. We've had an event in Fresno where um, we've done everything bilingually. We're translating Normal Women's Alliance materials. Um, I may work with uh, California Normal to help translate more. Um, <laughs> but you know, we have, uh, what is the message that we can give? And, and I think that's really, um, something that hasn't been addressed yet. <laughs> Thank you. Coming up. My name's Charmy Golson. I'm from Michigan. I'm a former LEAP staffer. I ran their op-ed project, and I'm founder of Michigan Moms United to End the War on Drugs. And I've been working with an organization to, to get some legislative together based on repealing the state statutes for cannabis uh, uh, criminal penalties. Uh, I missed one meeting. And the dispensary organization has moved in really quickly, and I get a text right now in this meeting saying, oh, we've got two proposals now. One's decrim, and one is legalization, based on the dispensary owners, the organization who, who, who don't want to see, I don't know what they don't want to see. But my question is, how can I, and, and I know the messaging, I know how to do what about the children, I know how to do all this stuff, how can I convince, we've only had medical marijuana for almost three years in Michigan, how can I convince the other people that I'm supposed to be working side by side with, that this is going to, this is the only thing that's going to stop them from kicking in our doors and taking our stuff, is full legalization. Okay, thank you. Both of you, please walk over here, okay? And thank you all for putting up with my completely authoritarian running of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, Chris Porto, Phoenix College. My question is about the possibility of limiting uh, drug legalization just to certain areas such as red light districts or enclosing the red light districts with intense security, um, in a sense, incarcerating the drug vice in just certain areas and then, you know, keeping it illegal elsewhere. I mean, the model of just certain, limiting it to certain particular areas, perhaps, you know, incarcerating the vice in those areas. You know, is that a possibility instead of trying to legalize drugs across an entire state or, you know, across the entire United States or elsewhere? Because it seems like, we get close to 50% in terms of passing the ballot initiatives, but a lot of people get scared right before the vote, and then you know, they back off from you know, supporting the initiative. But. Hi, I'm uh, Bradley Steinman, a second year law student from Lewis and Clark Law in Portland, Oregon. Um, and my question is, uh, has to do with some low-hanging fruit. I'm not really sure how to word it, but there's all of maybe six or seven chapters of SSDP at law schools around the country. I don't know how many normal chapters there are, but really, Law students right now don't have that many prospects for the future, uh, for real. I've got a job with a medical marijuana attorney right now, but most of my classmates don't. 
And I'm just curious why there isn't more of a presence of the DPA or normal or SSDP trying to tap into law students and why they don't think that we're an important enough market to make change when we're the future of the law. So that's my question. Okay, so in the, in the few minutes we have left, um, of those four questions, some of them may not get answered, okay? And let's be okay with that. Um, uh, but, but we're gonna let the folks up here um, uh, step up uh, to the mic. I'll call on you and keep it very short so yeah. that we can get out of here on time. I'd address the states and Fed issue. The Congress is not moving at all in this direction. All the action for the ensuing next five to 10 years is still gonna be at the state level. And when a state, it doesn't matter what state it is, actually legalizes marijuana, then we'll probably have a rocket ride to the Supreme Court. Because for all these years, people like Graham and others have been standing there before the appellate and Supreme Courts arguing from us, the dissidents. At some point, the state will be the litigant in the case, and they'll be white, waving the Ninth and Tenth Amendment around. It'll change the dynamics. Who else? Anna. I just want to say that the implementation of this is really, really important. So this goes to the question of the red light districts. I can't tell you why, but we tested the notion of coffee shops like Amsterdam and you know, dispensaries being places where people could use. It turns out most people want people to use marijuana in their own homes privately and have it not out in the open. Now that's part of the problem in terms of changing attitudes. But it's just a highlight that whether it's production or distribution or where you use it, they, when you get into the details, it's a morass and it's, um, can really take, it can take you down. It can take that. It can be the the unexpected thing that creates backlash. And to conclude, I'd like to say that I want Graham to moderate every panel I'm ever on. <laughs> Very kind. Go ahead, Mark. I, I just wanted to. The, the the answer was implicit in the question that the Latino vote is unbelievably critical, and there there is work to be done. We don't start from a great place, and but there are there is plenty of persuasion. And again, keeping our ears open to what people who start strongly opposed to us think is a very important part of change. It's not just getting our, it's not just talking to, getting everybody to support us, but getting people respecting and listening carefully to the opposition and understanding how to navigate it, minimize it as best we can. Yeah. Okay. Celinda. Uh, two quick answers. First of all, on the Latino, very, very important question that you asked wherever you are. And uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the Latino moms terrified for their kids. Uh, so all of those factors we've been discussing amplified. And we see that in other areas too. I mean, we shouldn't think that this is, I mean, they were the ones who moved the first when those uh, kids ads came up against Prop 8. Uh, also, Latinas bring an understanding, a mixed understanding of uh, this from their home cultures as well. So we really shouldn't think about, we can take the Anglo strategy, translate it into Spanish, we have the Latino strategy. Um, and in fact, you know, in the choice arena, for example, half of Latinos in America think that choice is illegal in this country because it is illegal in their home countries. Uh, so we need entire, we need much greater research in that area. The other thing I would say, frankly, is, and I guess it depends, the federal strategy, and I'm not an expert on it, but just the federal political strategy, I don't think this administration even believes in what they're enforcing, frankly. I think they think they're politically scared. And so I think one of the strategies we ought to have is a Democratic primary strategy. I think it will be impossible, for example, in four years, for the winner of the Democratic primary for president not to have a much different position on marriage equality. I don't even think the current ones believe what they're saying. And they're obviously waffling like crazy. So we ought to have a strategy that also says the next Democratic primary nominee ought to have a very different statement on this policy. And I think they're going to come out of a generation where they don't even believe what they're saying right now. Um, Dave, any last words? So um, I don't think there's any doubt momentum is on our side. Um, this conference is 21 years after the first such conference that I attended. I was a puppy then. Um, and it's been 15 years that we've been living with medical marijuana. Um, the, the momentum is incredible, um, I think, for our side as well as our opponents. Everybody seems to understand that it is a question of when and not if. Um, but I just want to be sure that we are strategic uh, in picking our battles um, so that we get to keep what we win. So I'm going to hand the mic to Ethan in a little bit, uh, in a little bit, in a few seconds um, to to, do, to to bring us to a close. But I want to say something first myself. I I am astonished and impressed and in quite happy 
by the increasing level of sophistication by this movement. Um, the folks on this stage are some of the you know, smartest and most professionally qualified people working on a range of progressive issues, and we are very lucky to have them involved. But you out here are also increasingly the most smart, professional, talented, passionate people pushing for the marijuana reform and broader drug policy reform that we've seen. And I, I've been around this movement um, not quite as long as Dave, but I, I also see a tremendous evolution here. So um, thank you, Ethan, for asking me to uh, uh, make the trains run on time. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be able to be here and be part of, of the movement and the conversation. And thank you all very much for the work you do. So Ethan, take us home. Yeah. Thank and, and thank you, Graham. You've done such a wonderful job. I think we're going to have you do this at like every session until the end of the conference here. Um, I guess just just a few things. I mean, I, I think the first thing is, of course, is that we do our. We, the fact is, we're probably going to have ballot initiatives on the ballot, at least in Colorado and Washington, and probably if Dave and others succeed in other states as well. And we're going to have no choice but to try to win those, even though the conventional wisdom says it can't be done. And that's going to mean, you know, get being as smart, savvy as we possibly can. I think secondly, you know, probably the, 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 the biggest problem we have in a way, I mean, you know, we all point our f finger at Obama and the disappointment. And I think on, yes, it's, I think it, it's pivotal to, that part of the, the challenge has to be that when the drug czar and the head of the DEA and the head of NIDA are mouthing this bullshit and this stuff that's just factually inaccurate, that's old line propagandistic, the more effective we can, begin, we can be on calling on them. Not just the online petitions, which are great calling o Obama, but it's really challenging them on the merits, on the substance, you know, keeping them honest. But the fact of the matter is even a bigger problem than Obama and sort of weak-kneed Democrats are Republicans. The Republicans are a nightmare on this issue by and large. I mean, apart from Gary Johnson and a few other, some of the libertarian ones, Republicans, you look in the polls, only one third of them support legalization. Medical marijuana, that means they barely break 50%. There's only been one state, I think New Mexico, in which one house, you had a majority of Republicans supporting a medical marijuana bill. We gotta figure out a way to break through on that. There's this right on crime initiative that's beginning to move forward, but they're not touching the marijuana issue. Penetrating with the Republicans, maybe it's this gun piece. You know, when ATF came out last month, month and a half ago, and said that if you have a medical marijuana ID card or, uh, or patient recommendation, you cannot legally get a gun license. I mean, what is there? One million medical marijuana patients are close to in America right now, many of them living in states like Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Montana, Vermont, New Mexico, gun-friendly states, sometimes with gun-friendly Democratic elected officials. We gotta find the crossover things to break through with the Republicans. One reason why Obama won't do stuff, or what Gavin Newsom was talking about this morning, it's not just you got, you know, old-line progressive Democrats still scare their shadow on this stuff for reasons that don't, that are not consistent oftentimes with polling. It's that they know that the Republicans are there fiercely, you know, propagandistically opposed to this stuff. Breaking through, I don't know what the answer is. I think testing on that and seeing what it's going to take to move it forward is absolutely going to be pivotal. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you to the panelists, and thank you, Graham.